Good afternoon, everyone. It is Friday, July the 10th, 2020. It is currently 1245 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church located here in Ovalo, Texas. I don't know how your day is going. Um, Now, I know some of you may be listening to me live. Some of you will hear this as a recording. Whenever you hear this, I don't know how you're doing. I don't know where you are. I don't know when you're listening. I can only speak for myself as of right now. I, I'm i not in a very spiritual frame of mind because I'm a little frustrated. In fact, if you listen to my last two live broadcasts, dealing with uh, some news about the church, churches, and the government, and money, yeah, very discouraging, very frustrating, uh, just showing you the kind of the spiritual climate uh, in churches all across the United States of America, and it's a uh, it's it's a frustrating it's a frustrating situation. It's something I've been talking about for a very long time that there's just there's almost some uh, there's a spiritual problem in the church, and and I know the church is worried about everything happening in the culture, but man, we've got to start looking in the mirror at ourselves because we've all got enough we've got our own problems. And thinking about that, we do need to look in the mirror. Because that's going to be a perfect transition to what we're about to engage in. I thought, since I spent a lot of the time this morning focused on that, talking about that, I was looking at the clock and I'm like, you know what? I probably should go back home now. I need to eat lunch and do some other things today. But before I go, I need to engage in at least um, my afternoon devotional time, my, my, my afternoon devotional study. I tr- again, I say this all the time, only for encourage- encouragement that I try to have a morning devotional, an afternoon devotional, an evening devotional, a late night devotional. I don't always pull that off. Sometimes it's, uh, I go, uh, you know, days, maybe even a week without pulling it off. But I always, at least, I, when I say pull it off, doing it all four times, I usually fell fell in doing that. I try to at least, you know, one or, t- or one or two times a day, stop everything and say, okay, time to focus on something spiritual, so to read, memorize, do something spiritual. So um, I was looking at the clock and I'm like, man, my morning devotional time went flying by and I missed that. Fast approaching one, fast approaching 1 p.m. here in West Texas. So before I know it, the afternoon devotional time is gone. So I better not go home. I better sit back down and uh, do something of, that will be spiritually edifying to help build me up spiritually, to help set my affections on things above, not on things of this earth, and try to, uh, you know, help myself spiritually. And whenever I do that, you know what I love to do? I love to grab the microphone, hit the big red go live button, and, uh, well, have my devotional study with you. You're invited to participate. Remember, my devotional studies are happening in real time. They're not rehearsed. I don't sit down and try to plan it all out. Oh, oh, this would be a good point. This is a good point. It's just real me, you, sitting down, having well, a, a spiritual discussion, a spiritual focus. And uh, we never. I, sometimes I don't know where it's going to go. Uh, sometimes I think it's beneficial. Sometimes uh, your silence tells me that it wasn't beneficial. But um, it if it's not beneficial for you, it's beneficial for me because it's my devotional time. So today, you hear that? I have in my hand, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. Now, um, I'm trying to do two things this summer. I'm trying to focus on the book of Proverbs, and I'm trying to focus on The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. Having two different focuses, probably not a good idea, but I'm trying to do that. And um, I've, I've, given you the background. You can go under the VBC podcast to listen to all of our messages about this book, um, sermons on it, and all the things we've done. We've had a lot of discussion. The last, we, we finished chapter one of book one um, and the imitation of Christ. You'll have to listen to that podcast under the non-Catholic Catholic podcast because we got into a discussion of the Catholic teaching on mortal and venial sin. Um, I think that was pretty interesting and beneficial. But today, for my devotional time, I'm in book one of The Imitation of Christ, chapter two. And we're going to have a, well, we're going to have an interesting discussion, and it's really going to do a, a, a lot with how we look at ourselves. When we look in that mirror, what do we see? Do we have a correct estimation? Do we have a correct understanding of what we see? 
When we think about ourselves, when we see ourselves, do we have a correct understanding or do we have a wrong understanding? And this is going to play right into what Thomas Akempis is going to um, to try to uh, emphasize in chapter two of book one. Now, we're going to look into this. Hopefully, we're going to see what kind of spiritual nourishment, spiritual food for thought we can get. And hopefully, um, and what I hope always with my devotional thoughts, I'm always hoping it'll spark a, a broader and longer conversation that could b- lead to follow-up episodes. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but hopefully you'll find this to be beneficial. Here we go. We're not going to get too far, right? Chapter 2 of Book 1 of The Imitation of Christ, the chapter heading and my, uh, my edition of the book is this. Humble conceit of ourselves. Humble conceit of ourselves. Now, when I, when I, I saw that title, I mean, I've, 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 I've been through this book before, but I saw this title the other night. I picked up the book and I just looked at humble conceit of ourselves and I set the book down. So to be fair, I've given this a little bit of thought. And when I look at that title again, humble conceit of ourselves, that title just gives me pause. I'm like, okay, now I've got to really understand the title. Now, I know some people hate this about me, but it doesn't matter if I'm watching a movie, listening to a song, reading a book. I got to stop at everything and really try to unpack it and think about it. So humble conceit, humble conceit of ourselves. That seems like a weird humble and conceit. Don't those two things not work together, right? But so what do we mean by humble conceit? Well, if you just look up the word conceit, The word conceit means excessive pride in oneself, excessive pride in oneself. So conceit is typically how one views themselves, how they view themselves. And they view themselves, if if you have conceit, with excessive pride in oneself. So what Thomas Akempis seems to be saying, at least to me, that we need to have a humble conceit, a humble conceit estimation of ourselves. We need to see ourselves through the lens of humility. We need to have a humble understanding of ourselves, a, hun- a humble perception of ourselves. We don't need to be filled with self-conceit. We need to be filled with a humble estimation, a humble perception of self. Now, here's the thing. What is required to have a humble conceit, a humble perception, a humble estimation of yourself. What is required? Now, I believe theologically this can be, I think this can be demonstrated, the only way to have a correct estimation of yourself, the only way, and you, and people of Victory Baptist Church know what I'm going to say. People have listened to this podcast for any length of time know what I'm about to say. The only way you can see yourself as you truly are is to see God as he truly is. The only way to truly see yourself as you really are, a correct, humble estimation of self is to see God as he truly is. Because once you see God high and lifted up, Holy, holy, holy. You know I'm referencing Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah saw God high and lifted up upon his throne, holy, 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 then Isaiah then saw himself as he truly is. And and when he saw God as he truly is, then he could understand himself as he really was. And guess what Isaiah said? Woe is me. A prophet pronounced a curse upon himself. Woe is me. I am undone. He understood that he was unclean. He understood he dwelt among a people who were unclean. He understood his spiritual depravity. He understood he was bankrupt before God. He was helpless and hopeless before God. He finally saw himself as he truly was by seeing God as he truly is. I cannot express that enough. So this is an important chapter, humble conceit of ourselves. We need that. We need a humility. And I know we live in a culture that's all about self-esteem, 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 self-esteem. And the church bought into that uh, for a very long time. The church kind of changed its message. You know, hey, you got to see yourself. You got to see yourself and give us all these ways to see yourself, to kind of build your self-esteem up. But we need a humble estimation of ourselves. 
Now, we could argue if there's if there's an extreme one way or the other, but but for now, our focus is, do you see yourself through the lens of humility? Do you see yourself that way? All right? If you do, it's going to have a profound impact on your life. You're not going to be looking at, uh, you're not going to be worried about, I mean, it's just going to change everything. We, we could get into whole discussion there. But let's see what Thomas Akempis has to say, right? Humble conceit of ourselves. So there's a little breakdown of the title, all right? Let's see how far we can get. According to Thomas Akempis, every man naturally desires to know, but what does knowledge avail without the fear of God? That's a very important question. What advantage, what does knowledge truly give you? What advantage to, do you gain from knowledge? What what value is knowledge if with that knowledge it is not also does not contain with it the fear of God? What does knowledge avail without the fear of God? Now, I would challenge you to write that down on a piece of paper. What does knowledge avail without the fear of the Lord? This would be a very important quote to write down or to say to yourself before you walk into church. You're going to come into church. You're going to hear the Bible preached. You're going to hear the Bible taught. But what value is it if without the fear of God? You can gain all the knowledge in the world, all the knowledge in the world. You can memorize the scripture, know the scripture, know the theology, answer the questions. But what does it avail you if there is no fear of God? And remember, Proverbs tells us, and this is a memory verse, if you are participating in our memory program this summer with the Bible Memory app, which you should download and join our group. If you need any help in doing that, email me at newsif at yahoo.com. But the fear of the Lord is, is the beginning of knowledge. So from a biblical perspective, true knowledge can't even be obtained without the fear of God. Thomas Akempis is kind of coming at it a different direction. What, what, does it, what, what, do, what does knowledge avail you without the fear of God? What do you truly gain from it? Now, you gain something. I don't, I don't think anyone can deny that because obviously you're gaining knowledge and knowledge is worth something. But what does it truly avail you. What is what is the true benefits from you? And let me ask you this. Knowledge without the fear of God. Is that is uh, let, me, let me let me state it this way. Knowledge without the fear of God. Is that a possible dangerous situation to be in spiritually? I will argue it is. Knowledge without the fear of God is dangerous because knowledge without the fear of God produces pridefulness, produces arrogance, produces self-conceit, produces a, an, a, an estimation of oneself that is, isn't accurate. With knowledge must come the fear of God. And here is the dangerous thing. That is one thing like, Seminary can't just give you the fear of God. They can give you the knowledge, you can't give you the fear of God. This is why so many times someone who's in seminary, they've been there a year, two years, they start getting this big head, they get arrogant, they get condescending, and, and, and they, it's just a wrong mindset to get in. Young pastors can do this. I'll give you my, I'll give, the, the members of my church know this story. I, when uh, the night I became a Christian, uh, the, the pastor handed me a Bible and I went home and I stayed up all night and I read the entire New Testament. I started carrying my Bible everywhere I went. And before, I think within, I think probably within three to five days of being saved, I'd read the whole Bible. At, uh, well, I'd read the New Testament twice and I'd read the whole Bible at least once. And I think within two to three weeks, I think I'd already knocked out the whole Bible two times. So I, I, was, I was reading like crazy. And when I, and so I started attending the church that, um, I, that my salvation occurred in. And I uh, started going to Sunday school. And at Sunday school, they would hand out these little booklets, like these little study guides, like, hey, this is what we're going to cover. And so I went home. I mean, I got, the, I got the first booklet. I went home. 
I think I stayed up. I think it was, uh, I don't know what day I got the booklet, but I remember just spending all day going through the entire book. I went through the entire booklet, answered every question that was in the book, read everything, looked up every cross-reference, looked up, looked up, looked up, looked, read everything I could find. I mean, I read and read and read and I had, thing, I had that thing marked up. And then I went back to the next week, Sunday school. And I, that first week, I was just like, this teacher doesn't know this material. Okay, I've been saved for like two weeks. This teacher doesn't even know what she's talking about. I think it was a female. I think yeah, it was a female at the time. Uh, this female doesn't even know what she's talking about. This is crazy. And sadly to say, I was getting the knowledge, but guess what? I did not possess a fear of God, not in any meaningful way. I didn't even know what the fear of the Lord was at that point in my Christian life. And I became arrogant. I became condescending. I was mean. I was cruel. I basically told everyone in the whole class that they were idiots. I basically told everyone in the church they were idiots. I told the teacher that she, I mean, I was, I was a jerk beyond all comprehension. And I became arrogant and prideful and stupid and it was bad. It was bad um, because pride without the fear uh, or knowledge without the fear of the Lord only creates pride. It only creates arrogance. Now that doesn't, now, now here's the problem. What some people want to do is then downplay knowledge. Just downplay. You don't need knowledge then. No, 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 no. We need knowledge with the fear of God, not knowledge without it. And you can probably see in your and in your own Christian life how that can occur. And we can be very arrogant and condescending because we get we get our the, we have our theology right. We've got our understanding of the Bible right. Look how much better we are than everyone else. No, you cannot be that way. True humility is when you are more aware of your own flaws, your own failure, your own ignorance than you are of anyone else's. True humility is where you see yourself first before you see anyone else, before you even consider anyone else. But what happens when you have knowledge without the fear of God, you have that knowledge and guess what you see? You see that knowledge in light of everyone else. You see everyone else first. And then you want to let everyone know how much you know. You want to let everyone know how little they do know. And then that's a bad thing. And, and this, that is arrogance. That's condescending. And uh, let me make it, clear. I think, um, I think sometimes th there, there's another way this works. And, and I, and, and I, I know Thomas Kempis is probably not going in this direction, but we'll, we'll, I just want you to consider this. I think there's another danger. I think some people are so worried about how they are perceived in the, uh, they, they don't want to be viewed. They don't want to be viewed from a position of humility in the eyes of other people. They want other people to perceive them with, in a sense, with self, self conceit, right? I, uh, now, try to stay with me because I don't want to lose you here, but this is a very important thought. When you worry about how, how uh, there's, there's the idea of perceiving yourself with humble conceit, that you see yourself through the lens of humility, you see yourself humbly, you see yourself the, the right way, you see yourself in light of God, you see yourself in the reality of who you are. That's self perception. But we can sit there and we can be so worried about how other people perceive us. And we want other people to perceive us, not with humble conceit. We want other people to perceive us with self-conceit. We want other people to, to see us and, and, and to see us as larger than we are, better than we are, smarter than we are, funnier than we are. We want other people to perceive us larger in the best way possible. And listen, that's a form, that's a form of conceit and arrogance, even though you don't realize it, because you'll, you will, you will not say things. You will not do things because you worry about how other people perceive you. That is an arrogance on your part. Because you want everyone to perceive you in a certain way. That's because you are preoccupied with yourself. You are so preoccupied with yourself and you're so, and when it comes to other people, all you worry, you're not worried about other people. You're not, you're not concerned with other people. You see other people only through the value that they can give you by how they perceive you. And you'll see this sometimes. People will be afraid to answer a question because they may look dumb. Why are you worried? Answer the question because it's about learning and it's about growing and it's about understanding. Who cares if you're wrong? But no, no, no. You want everyone to perceive you a certain way. 
you're not going to do this because people may think you look dumb. You're not going to do this because people may, you may think people look foolish. You are that's a that's a form of arrogance on your part because you are worried about how everyone sees you. You want everyone to see you in a certain way. That is your own self conceit. You're more worried about look. You're more worried about how that person sees you than you are worried about that person. You are more worried about how that person sees your value than you seeing the value in that person. Right? This is this has got some major ramifications here for our spiritual life. So every man naturally desires to know, but what does knowledge avail without the fear of God? Well, what, this knowledge just creates all of this prideful position that we 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 find ourselves in over and over and over again. Better Now, this is what he says, better surely is a humble laborer who serves God than a proud philosopher who neglecting himself studies the course of the heavens. Now, he's saying it would be better. It's better to be a a, a humble laborer who serves God than the proud philosopher who neglects himself and studies the course of the heavens. Now, again, some people will take that to play down the philosopher, to play down knowledge, or to play down the pursuit of wisdom. Just like, I don't need that. I'm just a humble laborer. No, you need to be the humble laborer who does still want to perceive, to understand, and to gain knowledge, and to grow in knowledge, but to do so with the fear of the Lord. That the problem with the philosopher here is the philosopher just forgets himself. All he's worried about is knowledge, 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 get knowledge, get smarter, get smarter. But there's no fear of God. There's no perception of self. And so it began, all he begins to see is himself. That's all he sees is his knowledge and his self, but he's not perceiving it or maybe even applying the knowledge to himself. Won't apply it to everyone else. So let me read this again. <clears throat> Every, let me take a drink of water really quick. All right. Every man naturally desires to know, but what does knowledge avail without the fear of God? Again, that what does knowledge avail without the fear of God needs to be written down on your refrigerator. You need to read it every time you come to church. You need to uh, you need to ask yourself that question every time you read your Bible. You need to ask yourself every uh, that question every time you get ready to listen to a sermon. And we probably need to put it somewhere at the front door of our churches. Hey, what does knowledge avail without the fear of God? We need the fear of God, or everything we're doing in church is not going to to to, to be of any value. And then Thomas Kempis says, "But better surely is a humble laborer who serves God." Then a proud philosopher who neglecting himself studies the course of the heavens. Whoso knows himself will grow mean in his own conceit and delights not in the praises of men. Whoa, this is a powerful line right here. All right. So whosoever knows himself, whoever truly knows himself, If he truly knows himself, he will grow mean in his own estimation. In other words, he's going to see himself in a completely different light. Let's see if we can get a different. um, Let me see. I think I got another copy of this book. Give me one second. Had to reach over and grab the other copy. A different translation of this. And I think I have uh, Sarah Danzler's uh, book, so... Hey, Sarah Danzler, I'm using your book. So, all right, here we go. And she's got notes in here. I love when I see people in my church highlighting things and writing notes. That's really good. That's good stuff. All right, okay, good. All right, right. here we go. Of thinking humbly of oneself. This is how this translation puts it. There There is naturally in every man a desire to know. But what profit, what profiteth knowledge without the fear of God? Better of a surety is a lowly peasant who serveth God than a proud philosopher who watcheth the stars and neglected the knowledge of himself. Right? So that's the thing. He, he forgets to know himself. He, he's, he's learning, 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 but he's not get, learning to know himself. He's not, because you can't know yourself without the fear of God. He who knows himself, listen, he who truly knows himself, he who true, he who knows himself well, 
is vile in his own sight. He who knoweth himself well is vile in his own sight. If you truly know yourself, you will perceive yourself as vile. You will, per- you will perceive yourself as broken. You will perceive yourself as defiled, as corrupt. You will see yourself as you truly are. Not the, not the mask you put on to convince everyone else how wonderful you are. If you know yourself, truly know yourself, man, you are going to see yourself in a way that's not going to be pretty. You're going to see yourself in a, in a way that you're going to realize how bad you are. And once you realize how bad you are, you're going to run somewhere for help. And that means you're going to run to Christ and his death And then you're going to say that what my identity cannot be in who I am. I need a new identity and it's who I am in Christ. Now I've got to see myself that way. But Thomas Akempis is not going there right now. He's saying, though, if you truly know yourself, you're going to be vile in your own sight. You're going to be vile in your own estimation. You're going to perceive yourself to be vile. So let me ask you, do you truly know yourself? And guess what? You can't know yourself. You can't see yourself until you truly understand God. You've got to understand God before you can know yourself. That's why you have to have the fear of the Lord because fear of God comes from a knowledge of who God is. It all goes back to that. And then he goes on to say in this translation, "He he who knoweth himself well is vile in his own sight, neither regardeth he the praises of men. Now, do you regard the praises of men? Do you regard it? My other translation, how did they put it? Um, Delights not in the praises of men. If you truly, if you truly, look, the way Thomas Akempis is working this out for us is this way. First of all, this is very important. Hey, what profit is knowledge without the fear of the Lord? It is of no value. It is of no value. If you don't fear God, knowledge is just going to puff you up and make you arrogant. And then we talked about some of the issues with pride. All right, very important. Then he goes on to say that it's better to be a humble laborer who serves God than a proud philosopher who neglecting himself or who doesn't know himself studies the course of heaven. It's better to be humble and know yourself than to be supposedly smart and a philosopher, but not know yourself. Why? Because whoever knows himself, look, will grow vile in his own conceit and his own perception. He will see himself as vile, as broken. Now, again, you can't know yourself without fearing God and you can't fear God without knowing who God is. So that's why our, our focus has to be on God. It has to be not on ourself. It has to be on God. It has to be on God. Then we see God as he is. Then I can see myself as I truly am. That's the way it works. And then once I know myself as I truly am, I will grow vile in my own sight. And then here is the part that you really have to ask yourself. Will delight not in the praises of men. Delights not in the praises of men. Wow. Now, there is no question the Bible emphasizes humility, that God resisteth the proud. He gives grace to the humble. If you talk about the things that God hates, he hates a proud look. God hates the proud. He hates pride. He resisteth the proud. The proud. He hates it stands against it. Pride is evil. Pride is a sin. We need humility. We are told to humble ourselves before God. This is the biblical biblical idea, right? Now, I would challenge you, if you want a little study to do this summer, uh, you should do a a study on pride and a study on humility, right? In fact, let's just, let me see what happens here. Let me see. Um, we probably have to figure out how, different ways to look this up. I'm going to the Blue Letter Bible app. If I type in humble, that's just the book of Proverbs. Let me go to the whole Bible, humble. Um, humble occurs 24 times in the King James, all right? 
So 24 times the word humble. Let me go to, let me type in humil- humility. Humility occurs seven times. So humble, humility, that you can look those up without any, any difficulty. All right, let me look up uh, pride. Pride occurs 46 times. So it's, it would take a little bit of work, but humility and pride, humility and pride. We, we, you really should look up all the verses where the word humble or humility shows up, all the word where pride or, or proud shows up. I didn't look up proud and, and create a, 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 a descri- right? Get a piece of paper. You'll, you'll, you'll have one piece of paper just for, just for humility. Obviously it'd be a, a, a section. It's not going to just do it on one page. You'll have a couple of pages of everything the Bible talks about in, as far as being humble or, hum, or and, and speaking of humility. Look up everything the Bible has to say about pride, being proud. Look everything up and at least get a biblical idea of what is being said. Now, you could then look up the word humble, humility, and a Bible dictionary. You could look up the word proud or pride and a Bible dictionary. You could also look up humility and humble and pride and proud in a, a, um, a topical Bible. And you could do a little study on both. You really should. You really should. Because this is, we, we have to have a correct, we've, we've got to ensure that we are operating from a position of humility and not from a position of pride. And again, humility is, is, the, is you because you are so aware of yourself that you see everything in relation, like that humility is about seeing your faults, your failures. You see, you're more aware of your sin, your failures, your struggles, your weaknesses than you are of anybody else. And when you always see everyone else's problems, everyone else's failures, everyone else's shortcomings, everyone else is wrong, and you never see your own, then, then you, you, are, you are so hijacked with pride that you're now blind. And the only way to fix it is that, look, you got, because you've got your knowledge, but you did not have fear of the Lord with that knowledge. You have to have with knowledge, the fear of God. You have to have that. And the only way you're going to see yourself as you truly are is to see God as he truly is. You have to get that down. Listen, and if you truly know yourself, if you truly know yourself, if you truly know yourself after seeing God who he is, then you were going to be, you're going to become vile in your own sight. You're going to say, woe is me. I'm undone. You're not going to be worried about everybody else being undone. You're going to worry about yourself first. But then here is the one I wanted to lead back to. Will not delight in the praises of men. Now, is that a biblical concept or is Thomas Akempis going too far? Because we all delight in the praises of men to some level. We all do. When I get an email, I got an email from um, another podcaster um, saying, in fact, let me read, read it. Let me read it to you. Let me read it to you. Let me see if I can find it really quick. And I, and I, and I'm very grateful for it. It, it it made my day, but is that a problem? Let me let me read it. See if I can find it here. Um, give me a second. Looking at notifications. Okay. Um, oh, here we go. Um, Yeah, uh, just some ideas. I really like your style and can tell you are an experienced orator. Whoa, wow. Now, he didn't say a good one. <laughs> he said an experienced one. But still, I, that made me feel good. I mean, that really did. That made me feel good. I mean, I, I, um, I'm, very, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful when someone you know, points it out. That, that I, I like when someone uh, sends me an email going, man, that was, that was an awesome, you know, devotional. That was an awesome, you know, commentary. That was an aw- 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 awesome analysis or, or that was a great sermon. What, whatever they, they hear, I, 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 I take delight in that. Now, again, does, was, would the Bible condemn that? Now, I think the Bible would very clearly state that what we should be focused on is pleasing God and not pleasing men, that to please men becomes a trap. 
right? If you're going to start trying to please people, you're not going to be able to please God, right? It becomes like this two, two masters. You can only serve one, right? Can't serve God and the love of money. You can't serve God and money, and you can't serve God and trying to please people. So I think the thing is, is um, Thomas Akempis puts it that won't, del- uh, in fact, let me read it again, because I don't want to put words in his mouth, right? Um, he's not alive to, to correct me, all right? Um, who knows himself will grow vile or mean in his own conceit and, de- and delights not in the praises of men, will not delight in it. Now, I will argue that, and, and again, I don't know how, Tom, how Thomas Kempis, how did the other version put it? See if the other version changed it a little at all. He will neither regardeth the praises of men. All right, those are those are strong words. So I'm sitting here trying to think about how to how to apply this. I I don't know if I think I think Thomas Akempis may go a little too far there. I don't know if the Bible would condemn never delighting in the praises of men. I know the Bible would definitely tell us this: Do not seek the approval of men. Do not become preoccupied with, with trying to please men because if you do, you're not, you're not going to be able to please God. In fact, let me see. I think I know where that scripture is. Um, let me see if I can find it really quick. Remember, these devotionals are in real time, so uh, you got to give me a second here. Um, I think I know where it is. Could be wrong. I know the Apostle Paul said it. Give me one second. Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul just is giving out some pretty harsh words. He basically is like, look, here, there's some people around you that tries to pervert the gospel. But hey, if an angel or anybody preaches another gospel, let them be a curse. Let them be anathema. Let them be damned. Like, you know, very, very, very strong words. And then he says, verse 10, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, for do, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's some serious words. I think that the, from the Christian perspective, the biblical idea is we don't go around trying to please people. We don't go around, we don't do things simply to get the, the, the uh, approval of men. And that, look, um, I can't speak for everyone else. I can sp- I'll speak it from a podcasting perspective. I cannot turn on the microphone from a Christian perspective. If I'm going to try to do this from a, a Christian perspective and go, man, I need to get that approval. I need to get those thumbs ups. I need to get those likes. I need to get those emails. I need to get those follows. I, I like if I do that because I, because I want that approval and I want that popularity and I, then, then I'm operating from a non unbiblical perspective. Now you could ask yourself though, how do you work that if my podcast wasn't about theology? If my podcast was about music or it was about wrestling? If, if, would, would it be would it be wrong for me doing all of those things, trying to get the approval of men, wanting that approval, wanting that praise? Is that not therefore then? Because even if even if my podcast is not about theology, as a Christian, I'm still supposed to operate from a Christian perspective, right? What am I doing it for? Is that is is those is the praise of men? Is their praise that means obviously I'm, I'm pleasing them some way? Does that begin to lead to me having a wrong estimation of self? Does that begin to increase a prideful, selfish, egotistical view of self an arrogance? Sometimes, sometimes we'll see this. Uh, you'll see this sometimes in the podcast world. Um, it's like when a, per, when a podcaster is brand new, right? I, I can just throw a podcast and you, you send a comment to them. Sometimes they'll be like, oh man, they'll respond to you. Hey, thank you. But once you, once that podcaster goes kind of from obscurity and then maybe they reach some big fame, like massive fame, then it'll be amazing how they don't have any time for you. Because now you don't give it, you don't, you don't, you don't do anything for them. I mean, yeah, listen, but they don't need to come. They don't need to go they, like sometimes like, Sometimes in the podcasting world, someone will help you out, right? They'll, they'll come to you and help you and, 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 and talk about your podcast or listen to your podcast or comment because they're trying to get something for their podcast, right? 
I understand that. And, th- and there's nothing wrong with that. Networking, working together. I think podcasters should do that to help each other out. But then if, but once that person has served its their purpose and you got what you wanted from them and then you just forget them and you move on and you're done with them because now they're insignificant and you're the big, you know, flavor of the month. Well, that's you're using people for your own benefit. That's not a humble conceit in your own eyes. That's that you've elevated yourself, that you're selfish, that you're narcissistic and all you care about yourself. So I think I think we have to put this idea that we don't delight in the praise of men. I think Thomas Akempis, I, I mean, I can't speak for him. Obviously, been been dead for a very long time. But he, and now remember, Thomas Akempis is writing in 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 the context of he lived his entire uh, adult life. What from eighteen? I think he entered the monastery at eighteen or nineteen. He lived in a monastery from like eighteen and nineteen until he was dead. So yeah, you're not probably going around getting a lot of praise from from your fellow monks. Okay, you probably, I, I, I doubt I doubt I doubt there's a lot of that going on. So it's easy to say, hey, you don't delight in the praises of men, yeah, because you're not around any. But if he was living in the world, there's lots of things you do. You do want the approval of men. You do want the praises of men. But you have to ensure, from a Christian perspective, that you truly are trying to please God and glorifying God, and that you've got to not allow. Look, like there's two things that can destroy a person. There, the, the attacks and the um, negativity and the discouragement of other people. Some people can say you're stupid, you're dumb, you're useless, and that can discourage you till you want to give up. And that can be very devastating to you spiritually speaking because you'll either be filled with bitterness, anger, hatred, unforgiveness. Like that can have negative consequences. On the other side, this is very, very, very important. The praise of men can be just as devastating to you spiritually. The negative things people say can be negative negative to you, but the the positive things people say to you can be be, uh, dangerous as well. Someone emailed me the other day and they said, you know, I wish wish they had a minister like me when they were younger. And they said, you know, don't don't get a big head. Now they were joking. They were joking around. Uh, But when I saw that, I'm like, you know, yeah, um, I don't want to get a big head and hopefully I never will. Hopefully I will always see myself as nothing more than a vile sinner trying to figure out this whole Christian thing. And I'm trying to figure it out just like you. I don't have all the answers and I stumble and I fall. I've made my mistakes. And and uh, yeah, I wish, I look, there's a part of me that wishes everyone in the world had a positive out, uh, perspective of me. And I, and I wish that I knew that there were people out there never saying negative things about me. I wish that to be true, but it's not. And I'm, I'm the last person to really care about trying to please people, but I still don't like it because there's a little bit of that self-ego, self-pride that's in all of us. It's a part of our nature. It's a part of our sinful nature. The, the, very, es, the very easiest way to understand the sinful nature is just with one letter, I. Sinful nature is all about self. It's all about you, I, 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 I. So knowledge without the fear of the Lord will only make you proud and arrogant. You have to have it. You have to see God as he truly is to understand who you really are and see yourself correctly. And when you see God as he truly is, that will produce the fear of the Lord. And if you have the fear of the Lord and you see yourself as you truly are, then you will become vile in your own estimation. You'll see yourself the correct way. And then you will not... I, you you will not be consumed and almost you will not be preoccupied with the praises of men all right here's the thing i think when you are preoccup when you are preoccupied with the praises of men and you seek it and you need it and you desire it and you don't want to do anything that would possibly keep you from getting it that is because you are filled with pride. You want, you are so needing your pride and ego to be fed. You see everyone else as simply instruments and tools to praise you so that you can get yourself exalted and lifted up. And then that's now, now that's viewing people not, you're not viewing other people as valuable. You know, the value you see in other people is, is what they can give you not what you can do for them. That is completely an unbiblical way of seeing other people. All right, I'll stop right there. There's a lot there to unpack, a lot there to unpack. So here's what I'll do. I'm going to read that whole section in this translation. 
All right. I'm going to read it in this translation. There is naturally in every man a desire to know, but what profiteth knowledge without the fear of God? Better of a surety is a lowly peasant who serveth God than a proud philosopher who watcheth the stars and neglecteth the knowledge of himself. He who knoweth himself well is vile in his own sight. Neither regardeth he the praises of men. First par- part of the first paragraph of chapter two, book one of the very famous book, book The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. I would love to get your thoughts on all of this. Email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and please make sure that your email contains at least three praises of me. Tell me how wonderful I am. No, no, I just, I really just want your thoughts and I just want your feedback. And that's what I want. Now, maybe I'm doing that for, because I want to feel better about myself. See, see, now I've got to even question everything I'm going to do now. Maybe I should just never, I don't know what I should do now, okay? But struggle with me and try to figure it out because this has application to your life as well. All right, I'll stop right there. Everyone have a wonderful, wonderful day. Hey, during this crazy time of COVID-19, uh, Cases are spiking all over the United States and death rates are going up and people are dying. People are suffering. Please pray for everyone. Look out for one another. If you know someone has a need, let me know and we'll see what we can do to try to alleviate that need. If there's anything I can do to help you spiritually, tell me what you need and I'll do what I can. Um, But uh, please pray. Pray for pastors. Pray for churches as they're trying to struggle and how how to move forward in this crazy time that we live. All right. God bless.